All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending our presentation. Uh, if you're looking for the right room, you are looking at parsing the differential problem. Uh, Bun Sim will be presenting today. So uh, thank you for attending. Uh, I have a couple quick announcements before we start. Uh, one is, of course, we'd like to thank our sponsors who make this possible. Uh, without the help from sponsors such as LastPass and Palo Alto Networks, uh, we wouldn't be able to do these. Uh, along with other sponsors uh, such as uh, Invincim, FlexTrack, and even BlueCat. Uh, it's their support along with others uh, who support and donate, uh, including the donors and volunteers who make this event possible with even their time. So thank you for being here and for supporting that. Uh, just remember, uh, as a courtesy, uh, please keep your cell phones off or in like a buzz mode. The entire presentation is being recorded. There is no reason, no reason to uh, take pictures of the screen or take video. It's all going to be online, so there's no problem there. It's all being uh, broadcast up to YouTube uh, and will be there for future purposes. So there's no reason for you to have to worry about that. Uh, also remember, please do keep your masks on and above your nose. Uh, it helps keep everybody safe. And uh, one thing we would ask is, if you do have questions towards the end of the talk, please use the microphone in the center of the room. It's not so much for us, we can hear you here. It's because it is being recorded that helps us capture that question in the recording so that whoever watches the recording will be able to hear that question as well. So please, if you have a question towards the end, uh, come up and use the microphone in the middle of the room. Um, uh, also, as a reminder, uh, if for any reason you do take a picture before or afterwards, uh, we do have a policy here at B-Sides that says you explicitly need permission for anybody who might be in that photo, right? We're a little sensitive towards uh, capturing the uh, photos or images of certain people who would choose to remain more anonymous. So, and we do try to respect that. So please try not to take any photos where you don't have explicit permission of uh, anybody who might be captured within that. So, um, all right, with that, I'd like to go ahead and give a round warm welcome to Boone. Boone, go ahead and uh, take her away. Hi. <laughs> so, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, I'll be talking about passing differential problem. So, this, if you have heard about this, um, good. If you have not, then no, let me take you down some memory lane and uh, a bit of storytelling on why we should care about this and how it not just affects what we do in cybersecurity but software engineers as well. Because I myself am uh, currently a software engineer. So I'm from Singapore and in the day I'm a software engineer. And at night I teach at a local university. So I'm a part time lecturer teaching cloud systems. And I play for CTFS.SG uh, CTF team and that's my handle. So the key takeaways for today, um, what, which I'll be delivering is um, what is passing differential problem? Some of you might not know what it is, right? And how does this affect us? Like, why should we care? And how can we address it um, throughout the entire ecosystem? So just imagine this, that we have a single system that we built freshly, like, hey, I have a super app idea. Let's build something, right? And we all always start with this monolithic architecture. Everything is locked into one giant service. And then we expose different paths and resources, right? So, but as we progress, we would think, hey, uh, the system is getting larger, and let's try to implement different subsystems into the ecosystem. And that's how we grow, right? We don't recreate the thing and break it eventually. We try to add new, new features or new subsystems into the entire ecosystem. As we grow, uh, we might introduce um, different systems with different languages. So it could be at, at the very beginning I'm using Django as my primary language or system or uh, framework. And then I decide, hey, I'm, I'm, I want to be like Fang. I want to use Go. And then I'm like, I want to go dangerous, let's use Node.js. So these are some of the different ways of creating things. And part of it is also the motivation to explore the path of least resistance to Go systems. Now, I work in a super app company, 
right? Um, it's a ride hailing app similar to Uber in Southeast Asia. And what we do is we have a large system that's built in a single language, but new businesses and new technologies, oh, sorry, new features are built in using different technologies because the people they hire to do all this um, are comfortable in something else. Like, hey, um, I'm going to build a, uh, build a car rental system in Node.js. And once that proof of concept is done, um, you, we realize that, hey, we have gotten knee deep into Node.js. We shouldn't be refactoring these things, right? But the main set of features and services, they are written in an entirely different language with an entirely different pipeline. So one of the motivations to expand with different languages is to explore the path of least resistance, not just in a scope of technical uh, work, but also business decisions as well. So what could go wrong if different systems um, have recurring variables, right? So for instance, in system one is written in Go, and system two is written in Django. What could go wrong? Right, so let's take a look at some sample code. So this is something that could be written, right? For the top part, it's Go. So you have a param, there's, you got it from this ul.ul.query.get. So this is the reading directly from the HTTP package. And then this gets the value that's tagged to foo. And in Django, you do the same thing as well in Django's um, uh, way of doing it, which is to use request.get.get and you get that uh, value of that variable. It's looks the same, right? If let's say I pass it from the first system to the second system, it should be reading the same thing, correct? But in fact, it's not. So the first one, we read as John. And the second one, we read as Mayor. Now, with this in mind, what if my first layer of system is a check, or security check, or some sort of a firewall, right? And that got through my firewall, and the back-end downstream systems that is reading the value of the variable is a totally entirely different framework. And it's reading the, for example, an SQL injection payload. So that bypasses the first layer of check and breaks universal logic within the system. So why does this happen? So these two images, they are from the official uh, packages and library documentations. So as you can see in the first uh, top part of this slide, the Go HTTP package defines that using the get function, it will return you the very first, the very first variable. Even though you have multiple occurrences, it will return the first one. But in Django, it will return the second one. It's a bit funny because I, when reading a source code, it you kind of feel like it's quite messy, but if you take these two together, it makes sense. So the get item, the get function from Django implements the get underscore underscore get item, which takes the last occurring variable in the request parameter. So that is why when we have this, Go will see it as John, and Django will see it as the second variable, which is the SQL injection payload. So this is what we call the passing differential problem. This was first. This term was first used in the LangSec uh, language security LangSec approach, where they described this as the different interpretation of messages or data streams by com uh, components breaks any assumptions that components adhere to a shared specification. So this is nothing new, and I'll tell you why. 10 years ago, in the Tangled Web, when Mikhail published the book in 2011, it was mentioned in, briefly in the second or third, um, the third chapter about passing differentials. And also Orange has mentioned this, but in a different form of passing, the, um, passing between DNS and also phone function, where he made a variable about HTTP parameter pollution, which stems towards the, uh, which stems from the passing differential problem. And also, re more recently, a GitLab blog talking about how 
passing differential can be used to exploit a foul write or foul read from the RCV 20206833. So this is nothing new and it's been mentioned briefly in many cases. And in fact, there is a, what happened? And in fact, um, there is available resources online. So this is from this table is from payload of all things. If some of you know that repository, I thought that it should be there. So I compiled different sources from uh, the, the information from different sources, and I made a commit to it, and it, it's it's there already. And people have been contributing to it, and it's good that we know what are we dealing with, because. As a software engineer, it's it's quite scary to know that my peers do not know that s different systems handle different uh, different languages. Sorry, different variables differently. So if let's say you look .NET and uh, Apache and PHP Juice, they handle it way differently from say Node.js or even Go or Python, Flask and Django. So if you have this type of architecture, you should look at this as well, so that you can make sure that your system conforms to what you require to do. So unlike URL and URI, right, we have I, IF, IETF, IFC 3986 to tell us how we should pass DNS um, as it is, there isn't to this day any IFCs telling us how we should handle URL variables and especially in multiple occurrences. And this makes it confusing for different frameworks because if let's say you are, you are a full stack developer working with different languages, you'll be like, hey, what's happening? You know? And so most of the times it could be this, right? And this is just the tip of the iceberg. It can also be observed in the entire body. For example, if you see the HTTP bot post body, it can happen. The HTTP haters, it can happen. And let's not forget that HTTP haters can be canonicalized or uncanonicalized. And moreover, um, I was reading some Django documentation yesterday because I was making these slides. Uh, Django would replace your hyphens in your headers with underscores to, to match their headers and do a dictionary. So I'm not, I'm not saying that there's a security impact, but it is an interesting implementation that they are doing this because if you see in diff other web packages, they could be just matching those by just making it lowercase. So that is one example of why we should pay attention to what kind of frameworks we are using. So, I've been saying about all these problems and what, how it affects us, but what can we do? Right? Of course, number one is to be aware of what we're using and uh, not to assume uniformity across the entire stack. And if we are, we, if we have the time and we are committed enough, we can create test coverages uh, to include such cases to see that, you know, if there is any uh, breakage of logic. Or we can just do it at the API gateway level and just normalize the, normalize the variables and pass it down to the downstream services. Now, today I've talked about web itself, right? So passing differential problem in web technologies is something that has been mentioned and spoken in small little places for the past decade. Uh, what about the cloud? So I think this is something that I would like to leave you guys with as a pondering thing to think about. <laughs> because uh, this is something I'm still working on, the differentials within cloud systems and how multi-cloud affects us and how we should be using it correctly. So yeah, um, thank you. Any questions?